chosen 
to be here with us this morning. You know, uh, interesting thought. You know the Lord knew you was going to be here before you even did. And so if that's the case, then God has something in store for you this morning. And so we come here this morning, first and foremost, to worship him. Amen. That's what this service is all about. And if you get something out of it, by the way, then that's a freebie. But we're here to worship God. And we want to start off by doing so by standing and singing a song here this morning. Hymn number 99. Hymn 99. Let me just encourage you. I know uh, sometimes we can go into a mode to where we just, you hear the piano start, you know the tune, and you just start singing words. But i got to encourage you to do this. As you're reading, as you're singing, think about those words that you are singing. About how truly God is a shelter in our time of storm. Let's sing that together, could we? some storms this week? Anybody? They feel like they're raging around you? Where do we go when those storms are raging? A shelter in a time of storm. Let's sing it. Here we go. The raging storms may round us be shelter in to be able to have our worship today looking forward to a great service this morning and also tonight god has really blessed us with some fantastic uh, music that i'm looking forward to and tonight we'll have brother ryan harold is going to be uh, sharing the word with us tonight we'll have a sing inspiration and a praise time and then finger food fellowship right afterwards when we go to do that we'll just uh, really just relax on this beautiful summer evening getting to know each other better and uh, meeting new friends and uh, relaxing bring a finger food bring a dessert we want everybody to come it's going to be a blessing and we have uh, Miss Tahani she's serving right now she's going to be cranking up the uh, snow cone machine for all the kids and we're going to have a fun time and I, I, I fit in that category because I haven't had a snow cone in a long time so we'll be enjoying those you come on out tonight as well at six o'clock okay 
We do have some folks uh, who are visiting with us. A very special welcome to you. Some have been here before. Some, it's been a long time. If it's, uh, you've never received an information packet, just raise your hand, we'll get one of those to you, okay? Basically, with that, we've, been, we've got a brand new connection card we introduced a month ago, and uh, it's got some information there you can fill out. And what we'd like to do is provide you some more information about our church let you know how we can help as a church, the body of Christ, how can we can reach out to you. There's an area for prayer requests, questions, comments for me. Um, also, uh, if you have interest in any specific areas, you can check those and uh, just get me a little connection contact. That'd be a great help. So if you did not receive one, raise your hand and uh, one of our ushers will get one of those to you. Okay, anyone like that? Great, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy. Your mercy endures forever. As we join our hearts together as one to worship you today, Father, may we truly lift up the name of Jesus and glorify you, God our Father. We pray for the fullness of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might be able to truly from our hearts praise you for the forgiveness of sin, praise you for the confidence that you've given to us that we are your child and that we, are, we have a home in heaven that awaits us. Father, we thank you for the, the ability and strength to make it through day by day and even to weather the storms of life, Father. We have a grace and a power that the world does not have, and we thank you so much for that, Lord. We thank you that we hold in our hands the very word of God that is our guide, our lamppost, and shows us the path wherein we should go. We thank you for your, your tremendous love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. you uh, looking in your bulletin and everything don't forget uh, there are the egg rolls that are for sale uh, camp is just right around the corner hard to believe but it's just a couple weeks away and with that in mind uh, they made up a whole new batch of the egg rolls uh, this last Saturday 50 dozen. 50 dozen a little smaller than the ones before so they're ten dollars a dozen the freezer back there is chock full of them so if you want to uh, beat the rush 
uh, before I know it'll happen. As soon as church is over, people will be, it'll be a mad rush to get to the freezer. So if you want to be first in line to get those, uh, and, uh, you can actually set up an order. Say, I'd like to have so many of these. So anyways, uh, they're there. All right. Let's go ahead and stand together uh, and have our uh, welcoming song, 609, 609. Now look, here's what I want you to do before you sing this song. Ready? We're going to do things a little different. Look around. Everybody stand up if you would. Look around. And look around and say, oh, there's a person there that I've never met. There's a person there I don't think I've ever seen them before. So when I have this opportunity to welcome, I'm going to make a beeline to that person to introduce myself and make them feel welcome this morning. Can you do that? Let's sing this song, 609. It's a great thing to be a Christian, it's the best thing I know, it's a grand thing to follow Jesus, anywhere and everywhere we go, it's a great thing to be a soldier in this army here below, it's the grandest thing to be a Christian, it's the best and receive our offering this morning uh, as brother joe has been sharing let's stop and think about what we do many already come prepared but just take a moment as the ushers come forward and think this is a time where we give back to god in a form of true worship we don't bring sacrifices of an animal but we bring our sacrifices of our daily life and for where our treasure is there will our heart be also so we're bringing our hearts to the lord um, be in prayer for our church. We are about $400 short for completing our missions for this month and about 4000 for our monthly budget. Sometimes with people traveling and folks away, they forget. And so Pastor, uh, Pastor Matt has created a way that when you are away, you can be able to take care of um, supporting your church anyway through all the different ways through technology. I'm so thankful for Pastor Matt. I could never come up with all this programming that he does online and on the phone apps, but he is about to unveil a brand new cross and crown app for the phones. He's spending a lot of time on it, and it's going to be a great thing when he unveils that. But uh, to be in prayer for our church. Brother Kevin, would you lead us in prayer? Let's all pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for 
letting us be able to call you your, your father, our father, and you are our children, Lord. And I want to thank you, Lord, for each and every one of us here today, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that could not make it for any other reason. Maybe I just pray, Lord, that you're able to uh, keep our eyes and our ears and our hearts open to Pastor's uh, message that he's uh, that he put upon his heart, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you continue to work with our church. We pray, Lord, that you continue to help us, uh, most importantly, work with our hearts and being that beacon of light for you, Father. Lord, we all stumble, and we're always going to uh, fall, Lord, but we know deep down in our heart, Lord, that you're going to be there to pick us up, Lord, and direct us off. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for our country. We thank you, Lord, for uh, our president and all that is appointed above us, Lord. Uh, we know, Lord, that uh, at the end of the day, Lord, that uh, you're going to take care of what needs to be taken care of, Father. And I know, Lord, that uh, each one of us are so entirely grateful to be living in a country that's uh, uh, free that we have, freedom that we have, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, for the uh, men and women that have sacrificed their lives, Lord, to give us the freedom that we have today of our, our religion and all those that have come before them. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this offering. I pray, Lord, that you please use this offering for your glory. I pray, Lord, that we give from our heart and not out of obligation. And I pray, Lord, for our missions. We continue to strive to, uh, to um, help us, Lord, to uh, continue to give uh, again, like not out of obligation, but through our hearts, Lord. We thank you again for our pastors. We thank you, Lord, for our deacons and all of our church members and families, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everything you do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs>
that this last song we sing before special music and pastor comes, hymn 112, hymn 112. The song reminds me that I'm so grateful that we don't have to go it alone, that God is with us, his sovereignty he takes care of us. And aren't you so glad that God leads the way in everything that we are to do? Let's sing this together. You can remain seated.
walking wounded ones who seek to make things right, to stranded souls in darkness who long to see the light. For those who tread a troubled road and feel they can't go on, there is a promise we can stand upon. Still is. Amen. Praise the Lord. He changes not, and he's just as powerful today for you and me as he was when he parted the Red Sea. Amen. And he brought forth the mountains, and he brought forth the great seas that were carved out in his great power. God's power is still available, not diminished in any way. Take your Bible this morning and turn to 2 Samuel in chapter 15. If you're just joining us, in our series of Bible messages from the life of King David, we have to stop and thank God for how wonderful a God we have. Amen? Amen. He not only has saved us, He has given us all that we need. Second Samuel. We are skipping a couple chapters. Brother Ryan is going to be sharing one message from the life of David tonight. And we skipped over that a few weeks ago, and we're looking forward to what God's put on his heart about that. No matter what you go through in life, you're going to find that the relationship with God is not always yippy-skippy wonderful. If you were to visit the average church in America that's holding services right now, there's this intense desire in churches across America right now that just, we want to lift you up, we want to throw that buoy under you and help you float along, we want to, we want to show you that God's awesome and, you know, He's so cool and, you know, God can relate to you and He's here all, you know, all, all about you and, 
you know, God is all about us, and so much so that He prepares His Word so that we might be able to deal with when life is not all yippy-skippy. When God allows things into our life where your life comes crashing down, and that does happen for all of us. You think about the young bride, and she's longed for this day of her wedding all of her life. And she's dreamed of it. She's got the hope chest and the dress, and all the bridesmaids are there. This is the great moment. And she has in her mind that marriage is going to be just this wonderful, wonderful, fantastic event. That it'll always be you know, just heaven on earth, and it's going to be, you know, I'm going to have these babies, and I'm going to have kids, and it's going to be so fun, I'll be able to put things on Pinterest, <laughs> and, and, and I'll be able to get a van and have, be a soccer mom, and, and then as I watch the kids grow, and I'm going to have a little cottage with a white picket fence, and we're going to have a dog and a cat, and everything's going to be wonderful, and then you, you, you realize that that might not be God's plan for your life. And it doesn't always work out. And I'm not just picking on the young ladies, but even men have their dreams and visions of what they're going to do and become. And that's why you hear about midlife crisis. Because they, one morning when they're 45, they wake up and they realize they are not even close. And they might as well just give up and they're too tired to start over again. So they just go out and buy a red sports car. Amen. They're just... I, and life is not all that we wanted it to be. I'm thankful for a wonderful God who knows my life is not going to be what I think it is, but he knows what it's going to be, and he has prepared me for dealing through those, those times in our lives. And one of those difficult times is what we see in the life of David. The man after God's own heart, who God loved and God blessed and made him, he took him from following the sheep to become the king of the most powerful nation on earth, and he never lost a battle, and he was always victorious, and and he was getting money coming from all these tributary nations, and he became exceedingly wealthy, and there was nothing he couldn't have. And and everything's just going great and wonderful for, for King David. And then we enter into these very dark chapters of 13 and 14. We realize, as we saw in our message last time, that his son Amnon committed incest with his daughter, uh, with David's daughter. They were half-sister, half-brother, and the news of that coming into the home just broke his heart. But then we, as you read on, you'll find that Absalom, Tamar's full-blooded brother, was so angry. He plotted and conceived this idea and this plan in his evil heart that he was going to get even with Amnon for violating and raping his sister. And without David really knowing all that was going on in his own son's heart, he he finds all of this news that Absalom, his son, calls for Amnon to come to this celebration in this party. And while there, he tells his servants, because he was a prince and he had servants, and Absalom says, all right, get, get Amnon drunk. And when he's drunk, kill him. And the news comes back to David that he has not only had his daughter offended, violated, he has now his son has been killed by his other son, This kind of news coming into the family is enough for you to say, that's disaster. Why does God put all this in the Bible? Why is the Bible full of those kind of stories? Because what we see in the pages of Scripture are these principles of life that will help us know how to deal with issues. No matter what our issues are, the principles are the same. And we see this very dark era in the life of David two days ago. The Washington Post had a contributing article by Janice Lynch Schuster. And on Friday, she published these words. She's a poet, and she described the dark days of her life. And I I read this, and I said, this is exactly reflecting of how David felt. As we go and read through the Scripture here in a moment, we'll see how he felt. And she captured it. 
And I think that perhaps you too can say that, yes, on those dark days you have experienced similar. She writes, Since the news of my son's death, my spirit often wanders alone on a small island where grief is my only companion and where the tide is always cold and dark. The evening that he died, Chad overdosed on what proved to be a cocktail of legal and illegal drugs. My spirit washed ashore on the archipelago of grief when the officers delivered the news to me that afternoon. Since then, the waters of grief around me are as deep and as wide as the ocean. She went on to write a lot more, which I, we don't have time to go into, but she, she expresses perhaps how David feels when he gets the news that he not only lost his, the dreams he had for his daughter, his princess daughter, he not only lost his son, but he is also now going to be killed by his own son Absalom, because Absalom is heir to the throne and is mounting a group of people in rebellion, a coup d'etat. He is going to usurp the throne and he is going to pursue his own father to kill him. David, realizing that he must leave, finds that this is a dark, dark time in his life. Read with me a few things we see in chapter 16. And I just want to prepare you a couple verses as we'll be looking at chapter 16 in a moment in the Bible. In chapter 15 it says, It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when every man had a controversy or needed to go to court, came to the king for judgment, Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed or deputized by the king to hear thee. And oh, he said, that I were made the judge of the land, that every man might which hath any suit or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him, to do him obeisance, to bow down before him, he put forth his hand and took him up and, and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom do all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. All this is taking place. He won over the nation of Israel to follow him and to forget David the king. And maybe a new generation come along and a generation that didn't remember the sacrifices that David had made and the years have passed and David is old and, and Absalom says, I'm going to take over the country. Look with me in chapter 16. David has to flee. And to make matters worse, three things happen. We see David, verse 1, was a little past the top of the hill. Behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and on them two hundred loaves of bread and a hundred bunches of raisins and a hundred summer fruits and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, and where is the master's son? Now let me summarize the story for you. Ziba was the guy, a few chapters back, that David said, you are the servant of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the descendant of King Saul. His dad was Jonathan, David's close friend. And with Jonathan, before he died, he said, David, take care of my family. And so David took care of his family and took care of Mephibosheth. And Ziba was the servant. Ziba comes to David as David is leaving the city and crossing the Jordan and, and going up onto a hill to flee for his life from his own son. Ziba shows up with all these foods and says, he says, what is this for? And Ziba says, you know what? When you left the city, my master Mephibosheth says he's going to take his opportunity to take over the kingdom now. That, my friends, as you read on, you'll see was a complete lie. Ziba 
was showing up to try to be a friend to David during his dark days, and he wasn't. He was positioning himself in order to try to earn points with David, try to get some kind of advantage to make his own master, Mephibosheth, look bad. There is a vulture swooping in. He sees the carcass of David on the ground, and he's going to swoop in. Not only that, read on in verse 5. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, there thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. So he's a relative of former King Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerah. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on the right hand and on his left. And thus saith Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Can you imagine anybody saying anything against the king? No. You attack the king verbally, off with your head. That's what could happen. But David, is his head is hanging down. He's traveling in darkness now as he's leaving the city. And out on this hillside comes this man who hates David. And this is his opportunity to start cursing him. This is God judging you for your sin. You should never have killed Saul. He didn't kill Saul. But there, the malicious mal mal maleficence that's going on here, th this horrible scene is he's throwing rocks at him and cursing him. Zeba is a vulture, Simei is a, is a vulture. But to make it worse, look down at verse 20. If you have your open Bible, back up to chapter 15 and verse 12. Notice it says, Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor. <laughs> From his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong, and the people increased continually with Absalom. Ahithophel was David's personal counselor. Notice in chapter 16, verse 20, what did his right-hand man, David's right-hand man, do? Verse 20, then said Absalom to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we shall do. Ahithophel has gone over to the side of this rebellion. David's own right-hand man. Verse 21, Ahithophel said to Absalom, go in unto thy father's concubines. You know what you need to do, Absalom? If you really want to show that you're the new guy in town, that you're the new king, David just happened to leave some concubines back here in Jerusalem. And he says, you know what you need to do to show that you're the man in charge? You go up on the roof and you put a tent up and you take those concubines and you put them up there so that all of the city knows that David's concubine wives are up in there and you go up there and you go in unto those women. That's the advice that Ahithophel gave. Verse 23, he said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he had left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And notice verse 23, the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracles of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and now with Absalom. David, when his heart is broken, leaving the city, now, all this is coming down in his life, and now Ziba is swooping in, and Shimei is cursing him, and the news comes to him that your, your right-hand man counselor has gone and advised your own son to do this to your wives. What darker day could you have faced than what David was facing? I thank God that we have a God, the great I Am still is, who lays for you and for me the principles we need to carry us through those dark days. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray that you would guide us into all truth, that you'd anoint my lips, that I might speak this word for you. I pray that you'd equip me, but more than, more than that, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in hearts. You alone, Lord, know what lies ahead in the lives of each of these folks or may even be occurring in their heart today. Father, for those that could not be here, perhaps are listening online, I pray that you would meet them where they are, that you would encourage them and help them. And Father, I pray that you would prepare us and equip us for doing what your, Bible, your, your holy word says in the Bible that we should do. Give us your grace now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes, and I encourage you to do that, I'll be very quick as I can. I'm going to give you a few points about what you need to do when your world comes crashing down around you. Dealing with disaster. Okay? Take a pen and jot these things down. This is perhaps one of the most critical messages you'll find in the life of King David. Something that I think will truly, truly help you. My heart is motivated. I'm very burdened for you. I hope that you can grasp these truths and be victorious when those dark days come. Number one, what did David do? Number one, the first thing he did, learn the lessons from the rod. Learn the lessons from the rod. God is going to chasten his children, is he not? I want you to notice what David says. He searches in his mind and his heart that when he goes through this, he is basically saying, God, you're allowing this situation in my life. How can I be more like you? How can I be more righteous? Look at chapter 16, verse 9. The verses we skipped over. Look at verse 9. Shimei is out there cursing David. You bloody man! This is God judging you and throwing rocks at him. And, but David happened to have uh, one of his mighty men with him. Notice it says in verse 9, Then said Abishai the son of Zeruiah unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And notice what David says. And the king, and, you know, what would you do? I'd be like, look, have you ever said these words? When, when your life is really messed up and some additional thing comes in and you're like, I don't need that right now. This is David. I don't need that right now. Sure, go ahead. I'm not looking. Off of his head. What does David say? No, he does not. The king, verse 10, and the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? He's basically saying, you always want to kill people. It's good in the army, but not right now. So, verse 10, so let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. Learn the lessons from the rod. Understand this, that when, God, when something is happening in your life, it is not apart from God allowing it to happen. And when he, the sovereign God of all creation, allows an event to occur in your life, it didn't happen without his knowledge. It didn't happen without him permitting it to happen for a purpose and a reason. And understand this, behind the hurt that is done by others upon you, there is a God who is allowing a chastening to your soul. And at the very heart of this suffering, David sees that the cup from which he has to drink was not formed by man, but it was mixed in heaven for his own betterment. Pain. And suffering upon you might be devised by the, the malignity of Ahithophel or the, the, the anger of Shimei, but at, by the time that the evil of their heart has been processed and comes to fruition, it has already passed through God's perfect sieve. And what comes through is according to God's will. So don't dwell on why is this happening? Let me encourage you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, you'll look it up. It says, for our light affliction, our light affliction, 
Anything that happens on this side of heaven, God calls a light affliction. Well, he's, he's misdiagnosed my problem. He doesn't know how bad it is. This is not a light affliction. It's so heavy. It's breaking my heart and my soul. Tear my limbs off. Remove me. Put bamboo shoots under my fingernails. The physical pain would be so much better than the emotional pain I'm going through right now. Oh, and God calls that a light affliction. Yes, because when you tap into the power that God can give you, that grace that you've not needed before, God carries the load, and it is an affliction, but it's a light affliction, and it's caused for our good. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, I want you to turn there and we'll come back. Please hold your place in 2 Samuel 16. But in Hebrews chapter 5, by the way, these points that I give, number one is the longest, and then the others are very quick. All eight. No, there's not eight. Hebrews chapter 12. A passage most of you are very familiar with, but it does us well to look at these scriptures again. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. When you're going through suffering and this trial of heart, verse 5, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And notice verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, you need to look diligently, and lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Did you notice that when you are going through chastening that God allows in your life, there is the opportunity for you to end up, like verse 15, a root of bitterness? God, why? Why not? Why, why me and my life and, and my neighbor over here who's not giving his life to the Lord seems to be blessed on every, every turn? Why is this, his life? I mean, a man told me this. My dad told me this. He said, sometimes you just feel like you, you, this, this man has an evil heart. He, if he fell into a, an outhouse, he'd come out covered with gold. Why are some people like that and why is everything happening to me? That, my friends, is the foundation for bitterness in your life. And so, don't go that route, and don't ask God why. Accept it as from Him and say, what do you have for me to learn? I'll never know all the reasons why God has allowed things on this side of heaven, but when I get to heaven, I understand, I will see, it was the love of God that allowed those in my life. Learn the lessons from the rod. Don't dwell on why. Number two, we see back in chapter 16 of 2 Samuel. Bear with me. Again, these are tremendous truths that will transform your life. We see them as David lives them out before us. Back up in chapter 15, we see what happens when David actually leaves the city. Number two is this. Feel for the Father's hand in the darkness. Feel for the Father's hand in the darkness. Was it all darkness that evening as David fled for his life? Look at chapter 15, verse 17. And the king went forth and all the people after him and tarried in a place that was far off and all the servants passed on beside him. Notice who was with David that night. Was he alone? All the Cherethites, all the Pelethites and all the Gittites and 600 men which came after him from Gath passed on before the king. Then said the king to Ittai, the Gittites, okay, God sends with him 600 of his own mighty men that were loyal to the death. But then in verse 19, he says, uh, then said the king to Ittai, the Gittite, 
Wherefore goest thou also with us? Why are you coming with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, whoever it may be. Go to Absalom, for thou art a stranger and an exile. Whereas thou camest, but yes, or you just joined my court a day or two ago. Should I this day make thee to go up and down with me, seeing I go whether I may not return? And thou back, uh, back thy, and take back thy brethren. Mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my, son, my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. This is an untold story that Sunday school teachers pass over all the time, and I don't want you to miss it here in the life of David. Here's this man who came to David just the day or two before, and he was in exile from another country. And David said, you can come in. I will not let your enemy, your, those hunting your life kill you. You live with me until the day you die. And so David, the very next day, is fleeing Jerusalem, and here comes Ittai, and he, he's like, here I am, I'm with you. And he says, you know, you don't need to be with me. And Ittai says, wherever you go, I will go. Even if it means death, I will go to you. Folks, that is an unconditional love. His heart was so overwhelmed with thankfulness to David that David has saved his life that he said, I will give my life to David, even if it requires my death. Folks, that's a sh couple short verses about unconditional love. And when you go through your trials, feel for the Father's hand. There is someone there. You may not see it right now. You haven't stopped to think about it because your mind is blurred and confused. But there are those around you who are the Ittites in your life who love you with unconditional love and will go to the grave with you. Don't ever forget that. God is good. And He allows the Ittites. He allows the 600 mighty men. We read on and we find that Zadok, the priest, comes running out with the Levites with the Ark of God. And he says, I want you to take the Ark of God back and, and don't bring it with me. But the, the priests were on his side. The 600 mighty men were on his side. Also, look at verse 31. One told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness, because I know that Ahithophel is going to advise Absalom in a way that's going to make Absalom successful. And I pray, God, that you turn it into foolishness. And it came to pass, verse 32, that when David was come to the top of the mount, where he worshipped God. Notice, he is worshipping God in the midst of his trial. Behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. Unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then shalt thou be a burden to me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king. I have been a father's servant, so will I now also be thy servant then thou mayest for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. Hushai was just the man David needed. He said, go back to Absalom, make your position in the court, and whatever Ahithophel says to advise Absalom, you be my man, kind of like the court spy. You advise against Ahithophel, and that's exactly what David needed. You have awaiting you whatever you need. You understand that? You don't see it at that time when you're in the darkness and despair, but God is equipping you and providing for you all that you need. So feel for the Father's hand. Feel that it's there. There are those that are around you and helping you and encouraging you. And don't ever believe the lie from Satan that you're all alone. Because that loneliness that begins to pervade your soul is a loneliness that will keep you down. You are not alone. You have the Father. And He compassionately sends others. It's as though God stoops over this afflicted soul whose back has been smitten with deep furrows of the rod. And God, through the blessings that He provides through the hands of others, pours the balm of Gilead into those gaping wounds on our back. It's the comfort of God through the hand of compassionate men. Janice Schuster, who lost her son in the beginning of the service, we, we, we read her article at the beginning of the service. She goes on to write this thing. She says, when you speak to those who are grieving, 
Most of all, please stop blaming the souls who succumbed to addiction. And stop blaming the families who tried so desperately to save them. Instead, try to visit those islands where the grieving live. Welcome them into your embrace. Hold hands for a moment as they stand in the tide pools that come and go and bear witness. There are times when a soul just needs you to be there for them. And there are times when you need others. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 3 and notice the very beginning title to Psalm 3. Perhaps you don't take the time to read the titles to the Psalms, but you should. They are inspired. They are the Word of God. In Psalm 3, in the Hebrew Bible, it's verse 1. Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. He also writes Psalm 4. Let's read verse 3 of Psalm 3. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me my glory and the lifter up of my head. What does it mean to lift up someone's head? It's just like a child. When a child is going through a really bad time, which you look and you say, your life is not bad, really. It is not bad. And their head is down. And they're sad and they're crying. And you go over there and you take your finger and you just put it gently under their chin and you just lift up their chin and you make eye contact and you say, it's not that bad. God is the lifter up of my head. He has to lift it up sometimes quite often. But no matter how dark the day may be, no matter how dark where you can't see the next step, feel for the Father's hand. It's there. Number three, cling desperately to the promises of God. Cling desperately to the promises of God. My, now, folks, if you want a definition of genuine faith, it's what David lives out here. What is genuine faith? A lot of people get that mixed up. I mean, you hear about people talking about faith all the time. You just tell God what to do, and you believe, and He'll do it. You just tell Him. And that's not genuine faith. That's not believing what God says. Genuine faith is not telling God what to do, but trusting His love and resting in His care when you cannot see the other side. You believe God. Back in chapter 15, look at two verses. What does David say as he's leaving Jerusalem? 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. Zadok also and all the Levites were with him, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God, and they set down the Ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the ark of God into the city. Notice, if I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. That simple statement right there is genuine faith. If it's God's plan for that to happen in my life, it will happen. I don't need to force the doors open. I don't need to kick anything open to make my way. And I don't need to force situations. I'm going to let myself go and trust that God is going to allow it to work out. That's faith. You see, David is dwelling on these truths that he remembers from his past. He that carried me through the wilderness. He that so often lifted up my head above my enemies, my God, the great God who stooped to create me in the womb, who has loved me, who has forgiven my sin, who has made me his very own. I believe that that God loves me enough. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I cling to that. When my heart has been squeezed so tightly, my heart is overwhelmed with grief, but you can't eat, you can't sleep, 
and it's dark and you feel all alone. But here's what you do. Learn the lessons from the rod. How, God, can I be more righteous? What are you doing in my life? Number two, I feel for your hand. You have been so good. And number three, I cling. I cling to these promises of God. Those words, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, they mean more than just that he'll be with me on the sunny days, those days where joy is in my heart, my soul is lifted to great heights, but I believe he's there when my spirit is racked with pain. David writes Psalm 61, he writes Psalm 62, he writes Psalm 63. And in those psalms, he describes that I long for God. Friends, if you long for God, that is to find Him. If you thirst for God, that is to feel the refreshing that He brings as water to dry, parched lips. My God is there. Cling to that promise. But finally, look at verse 26, and we end with this. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, he's talking about God. If God says, I have no delight in you, behold, here am I. Let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. Friends, what do you do when you're going through those dark times? You've been over those points. But you learn the lessons of the rod. You feel for the Father's hand, cling desperately to His promises, but understand verse 26. If it's God's will, and He's no longer going to prosper me, here am I. Let Him do to me as seemeth good unto Him. Jesus said those words in Luke 22, where the Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and He kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if Thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thine be done. Number four, surrender to the will of God. The American spirit that conquered the wilderness and has built this country to what it is, the American spirit that has faced all foes, the American spirit that is a fighting spirit and doesn't roll over and play dead for anyone, goes contrary to our whole culture, contrary to all of our flesh, contrary to the whole way that our DNA is programmed. It's called surrender. David says, if this is my last day, and Absalom becomes the king, and God allows that, whatever God wants, may he gloriously get. That's surrender. Surrender to God. And surrender is really where life begins. When you surrender your heart and your pride at the altar, at the foot of the cross, and you say, God, I've tried to be good to make my own way to heaven, and I can't do it, and the Scriptures tell me there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. All are turned out of the way. All we like sheep have gone astray. I can't do it. God, you're going to have to save me. I surrender my life. That's when God steps in and saves a soul. And then in the Christian life, as we try to live this life, and I'm trying not to sin, and I'm trying to live for God, and I fail, but I can get myself back up, and we fight, and we fight, and we fight, and we finally surrender. I, God, I can't do it. God, you're going to save me today, not save me for eternity. I've been saved and born into God's family, but today I need you today. And God says, I know you can't do it. Thank you for surrendering. Now I'm going to help you do it. And it's the same thing when you accept the things that you never wanted to come into your life. And you say, God, notice, underline, circle, highlight, put a, put a marker there with a big 
blinking light at the top of your Bible. Buy one, put a battery in it so it blinks all the time to go to this verse. If God doesn't want it to happen, here am I. May God's will be done. Folks, that's complete surrender, and that's genuine worship of an almighty God. What do you do when you're dealing with disaster? David lived it. In Psalm 143, I challenge you to go home and read that. You will see that David in his darkness reaches out for the hand of God. He thirsts for the promises and clings for the promises of God. And then he surrenders to God's will. I'm not going to ask for a showing of hands right now, but in the quietness of your heart, as we close this service today, have you done those four steps? If you've done those four steps, God will give you light in your darkness. He will rebuild the walls, and He will bless and prosper your life. But friend, I love you enough to share with you. That's what you have to do. Oh, David, he was a sinner just like you and me. And oh, we remember what he did and his falls and failures, how he failed at parenting and and how he was a bad example in what he did in, in, in his incest and all the planning for murder. Oh, we remember the sin of David. But what we failed to see is how much he knew how to walk with God when it mattered. And that's what I want for you. Oh, to God that we might be Cross and Crown Baptist Church that's endued with the power of God to deal with the dark days. And God, strengthen you, my brother. Father, we pray as we close today that you would help us to see and feel your presence. Help us to know that you are there. And Father, when these dark days come, give us strength to walk with you. Father, thank you for this time that we've been around your word. Help us to truly meditate on your word. And I pray that you would give grace for this hour and the days to come. Father, be with these decisions that are about to be made or being made right now. I ask that you would guide and direct and help us all together as a whole unit today, as a whole body, one voice lifting up and glorifying God, one body of believers taking the next step spiritually saying, God, help us to be like this example David gave. In Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and eyes closed as we close.